Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation and uh, just for the the story that you've been writing as the director of Cap mm. Chatfield's mm. life. So fitting that we would even use that word, but God, yes. you've been so gracious, so merciful. And uh, we just ask that you would uh, that you would be present. And ultimately, uh, this story would speak to people, that it would bring hope to the hopeless, that it would encourage those that need to be encouraged. And uh, God, would, would your fingerprints be all over it? Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome back to the Love Church Story Podcast. This is a really special moment for me because I'm sitting down with one of my best friends, Pastor Cap Chatfield, but you're not just uh, a pastor on staff here. We don't just do ministry together. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like we're like living life together in this 100%. season. We're literally uh, neighbors. Yep. So Backyard at, neighbors. Backyard neighbors. So this guy probably sees me uh, <laughs> sitting at in the same spot every, every morning, single morning. Laptop cracked open, head of the table. See right in the non-creepy way. <laughs> in a non right into yeah. your dining room. Right into the dining room. And I can look across and there you are on your back patio <laughs> right. on the second floor That's doing it. the same thing. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, just, dude, I just, I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful for you too. I, I don't know, you know, where, where I would be, honestly, in my life without your voice and without your friendship. And it's so fun to do ministry together, to do life together, mm -hmm. and ultimately to also just watch God do incredible things through you. Man. It's so fun to see like where things started in our friendship. And over the last handful of years of just running after him, I remember one specific moment where you and I, we were worshiping together. We mm -hmm. were on our faces and we were, we were asking God for more. Yes. And here we are. That, now we have the more. Now we're in it more. It so, like, and we'll, we'll crazy. touch on that. We'll get to that, but maybe, maybe take us, maybe take us back. Like I get to see your little kids run around. I can only envision and picture you as a, as a young type. <laughs> Dude. So like, take us back. What was life like for Cap Chatfield growing up? Well, this is, this will make more sense for you, but uh, I'm a hundred percent the same as Brave. So yes. Brave's disposition, he's my firstborn, six years old now. Uh, he and I are just like, just wired completely the same way. Uh, but I grew up in the DC area, grew up in Maryland, and uh, I grew up in a, an amazing family. So my story isn't, um, as you know, a handful of people is they have a traumatic upbringing. They have a lot of tension with their family. I, yeah. I, there was some little drama here and there, but mostly I grew up in a very wholesome environment. Parents really supported me and loved me. And I grew up in a church going family. Mm -hmm. And I emphasize that phrase church going because, you know, my parents, they believe in God, they love God, um, serve him, do mission trips and all of that. But the church that we were a part of, um, no shame on my parents. I just grew up in an environment where I never heard the gospel preached once. And I was never encouraged on a Sunday to open up the Bible. It was a very traditional church setting, wooden pews, kind of smelled like a goodwill a little bit. Come on. And you just, you know, you stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down throughout the service, uh, told multiple times throughout the service to open up your hymnal, but never told to open up the Bible. And I remember um, when I was hitting my 13 year confirmation or whatever, a lot of people watching, whether you grew up in a Catholic background or for me, it was a Methodist church or just a traditional liturgical church setting, mm -hmm. the confirmation was this moment where you would basically take the faith and make it your own. And I remember we did this, um, this retreat for all of the kids, 12 year old, 13 year olds who were going through this confirmation class. And we did this retreat out in like the woods. And I remember, I remember this moment of being genuinely curious about the things of God. Wow. And I went to my reverend and I said, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to read this whole book. I was talking about the Bible, obviously. I want to read this thing from beginning to end because if this book matters this much to God about us getting to know who he is for who he says he is, then I want to, I want to read it. And I remember what my reverend said to me was the most confusing thing I'd ever heard a spiritual mentor say. He said, I don't know if you want to do that. And I'm thinking now, you know, what's this like 20 something years later, I'm thinking, dude, like you had the deal, like on the, in the red zone, bro. You just closed that. Close that dude, month. you had, you have a 12 year old kid who as a spiritual leader now, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I had a 12 year old kid come to me saying that same thing, 
I would be like rooting him on, encouraging him like, dude, you got what it takes. Start in this book. I'm a resource for you if you want to get some insight on how to read this thing. And I would just felt so deflated that he would even say that and really confused because mm-hmm. I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, it just gets kind of confusing in certain parts. Some parts kind of get a little repetitive. And now having had read through the Bible multiple times, I know what he's referring to. He's talking about like first Kings, second Kings, first King or first Chronicles, second Chronicles. But it's like, there's a purpose for all of that in the, in the scripture and all scripture is profitable for teaching, for exhortation, for rebuke as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16. And I'm just thinking, man, like at that point, if I had the thought, if my own reverend says that this book is irrelevant and not worth reading, then I'm definitely not reading this thing. Mm-hmm. And that began this trajectory of me going down into crazy town. Uh, I was in high school. I was a skateboarder. I hung out with a lot of skateboarders that we'd go downtown. We'd go, um, you know, skate in the city and that whole scene is not really known for being a God glorifying scene. For it's, sure. It's really, uh, it's known for being like kind of fringe and alternative culture and really honestly, like very satanic. There's a lot of satanic imagery and kind of making fun of the occult. Some people are really in the occult in that world. And that's just, I went nosedive into that world and I declared myself somewhere in, in like midway through high school an atheist. I just rejected the faith completely because I didn't see the reality of it. I didn't see how it was relevant beyond a Sunday morning. I saw all of the people that I was kind of running with at that church. I saw how they were living Monday through Saturday. And I was like, if you guys aren't really about this life, then I have way better things on a Sunday morning that I could be doing than coming here and wearing a polo and khakis, (laughs) quite honestly. (laughs) So I was like, I'm, I just, I went and did my own thing. Uh, got heavily into just partying, drugs, alcohol, uh, promiscuous relationships with women, stuff that nobody watching has ever been involved in right, ever yeah, before. Never, right. But I went, I went all in in that world and that I just got my fill. And like, I would say one of the only redemptive things about that season in high school was as I was skateboarding, uh, we got really into video editing. Wow. Because when we were going and and skating downtown, we'd bring a camera and try to figure out like, okay, how do we record each other's tricks? And then I would take this camera back home and I would just skip homework. I was just like figuring out how to edit this footage. And this is before we had all of like the amazing software and technology that we have now for video creation these days. And I'm trying to figure this thing out. And I just fell in love with the video creation process. And my dad, you know, this is about junior year in high school. My dad's like, okay, Kat, like we got to start hunkering down. My dad was, uh, he got into Yale Law School and Harvard Law School. And let's just say, I I, I didn't inherit those genes. I'm like, he is the man. He's the 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 man. Intellect of intellects and uh, an academic of academics. Really brilliant guy. I have so much respect for this man. Yep. Um, And I have a great relationship with him even to this day. But um, I was just like, dude, like, that was for you. I don't know if I want to go to college. I don't know if that's really for me. And he was like, no, nah, bro. Like, we're, like, we're going to continue this conversation. <laughs> you will get a degree. You will go. Yeah, you will get a degree somewhere. He was like, but you don't have to go down the path that I went down. Yeah. So to my dad's credit, uh, man, he'll even say it like, he'll take credit for it this, to this day that I'm doing what I'm doing because he pushed me in the film direction. Um, and I'm like, dude, you can totally take credit for that. Cause he really, he really pushed me into a world I didn't even know existed. Cause when I was talking about college with him, he yeah. said, well, why don't you study film? Cause I didn't really know what I wanted to study. And I was like, you can study film. I didn't even know that was you're a like, thing. What? Yeah. I was like, that's all sounds like you're like cheating the system a little bit. Cause I loved the process of that so much. And so anyway, fast forward a little bit, he totally uh, pushed me into like following this new passion of of filmmaking, video creation. I got into the University of Miami in Florida to study film. Mm -hmm. I went there transparently for not just filmmaking reasons. I was in Miami for crying out loud. Come on. I mean, it's Miami, yo. Miami. And at that time, the the 30 for 30 documentary about the U had just come out. Oh, geez. So it was like, yeah, it was, everyone had the same mindset. Like we're bringing the swag days of the U back. And this was like, this was 2010. And so I go there. Uh, pursuing school, pursuing a film degree, pursuit of fraternity, 
And I was just going crazy in every single direction, trying hard in school, going partying like crazy in the fraternity, also starting a, a business in college. And, and long story short, you know, uh, the depth of, of my testimony, so, someone could probably see <clears throat> in another, another uh, podcast or whatever. Mm -hmm. But here's the bottom line of what happened yep. was I was pursuing everything that the world had to offer. I was having a ton of fun and I was also modestly successful at what I was doing in school. So it wasn't like I was this total burnout that hit rock bottom. I basically tasted and saw everything that the world had to offer and it didn't give me anything that it promised me. Wow. It didn't give me the peace that I was chasing after. It didn't give me the fulfillment. Honestly, I was really chasing after identity after, as I look back, I was like, I was looking to create my own purpose. At this point in college, when it really started to hit me that I couldn't get high enough, I was smoking weed three to five times a day, getting a blackout drunk almost every weekend, waking up next to women that I didn't even know their name when I woke up. And it was just like shockingly embarrassing situations. Yep, yep. And I just realized like, like, I just felt disgusted with myself. Mm. And I also had this idea. I mean, I was kind of drifting out of atheism more into agnosticism. I was at this point where I was like, there has to be meaning to life beyond this, beyond hedonism, beyond getting like filling yourself up with the pleasures of this world. And, um, and I started to believe in like new age stuff. I started to get really into new age philosophy and this whole idea of manifesting your destiny vision. Like you can be the director of your life. Your life is a movie and you can, if you can think it, it can happen. And I just started really buying into that mindset of me being the director of my own life. And it just was not a satisfying journey. Wow. And then I had a friend who's the only Christian friend I had in college. And he sat down with me and he shared, he shared the gospel with me. He said, do you know what the gospel is? I was like, I've never, I heard of like gospel music or whatever, but I don't know what, what the gospel is. I'd been in church my entire like, life. What? Bro, I went to church pretty much every single Sunday growing up and was never told what the gospel was once. And he explained to me that the gospel, the good news, is the most epic romance movie ever. Wow. And I was like, what do you mean? So he's talking to me in my own language, in your language. Now as a filmmaker. And he says, well, think about the, think about the, the fairy tale structure. Like a, it's the classic romance structure of a, of a story. You have a knight in shining armor mm -hmm. who has a princess in distress that he wants to live happily ever after with, but she gets taken captive by a dragon and put in a high tower under a curse. And the knight in shining armor needs to go and slay the dragon to rescue the princess so they could live happily ever after. We've all heard these stories or at least some sort of iteration of these stories in our lifetime. And he said, this is the gospel. That structure actually derives from the whole story of the Bible. And so now I'm like, my eyes are, and honestly, I was high when he was telling me this. I was, he was literally as my only Christian friend, he still loved me while I was still struggling with my sin. I was literally smoking a joint while he was telling me this. <laughs> and so you got to imagine how intense the situation as was. As soon as me. he says fairy tale, you're like, whoa. <laughs> like, I just go into this whole, I go into the matrix, basically. And so I'm like, I'm locked in. Like, what do you mean? And so he starts to break down. He says, <laughs> he says, Jesus is our knight in shining armor. The princess represents us, the bride of Christ who were meant to have relationship with God forever, without sin, without death, without disease, decay, divorce, depression, all of that. But a dragon named Satan enters the picture, deceives the bride of Christ, you and me as, as human beings. We get put under a curse called sin and we're separated from this knight in shining armor, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes to planet earth to slay the dragon named Satan on a cross called Calvary. He lays down his life for you and for me, buried in the tomb, raises himself from the grave on the third day, conquering death, sin, and Satan and hell forever. And all we got to do as the bride of Christ is put our faith in him. He breaks the curse of sin over us and we get to live happily ever after with him for eternity. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And so he breaks it down for me that simply. And I was like, 
dude, why did nobody ever tell me this? Wow. And, mm. and so now I'm having this like moment where I'm like, what the heck is happening? Like a couple of weeks go by, I'm asking him more questions, trying to understand what the, what, what it means to have a relationship with God. And then at some point he's like, do you want a relationship with God? And I was like, I think so. And he said, do you want to have that right now? And I was like, no, but I'll let you know if I'm, if I'm ready for it. Wow. And the next morning I was by myself, which is really interesting because as people who are listening, if they've heard your story or Pastor Todd's story, there's something really interesting about our teaching team with having an encounter with God in a car in a or car. in a parking lot. Yeah. And so I'm in this car, I'm in my car by myself on the way to the gym. And the Holy Spirit just wrecks me. And he says to me, Cap, there's only room on the set of your life for one director and you're not him. And it was in that moment, I just broke. I just started confessing my sin to God. And I said, I, I give up. I'm tired of living my life my own way. I'm essentially saying I'm done being the director. I want to be directed. I want to, I want to receive your script for my life. And I want to serve you. And it was in that moment, man, the peace that I had been chasing after with all these different things, I felt it in a moment. I, it hit me. It was like, it was like this backpack of shame and sin and guilt and pressure and, and all of that, that I was chasing after and all of these achievements and, and, you know, pleasure and all of that, it fell off of me. And I felt the peace of God for the first time. And he spoke to me and he said, Let's just make today day one. Wow. It was like the most non, no pressure invitation ever. And I knew what he was asking of me. I knew he was asking for a lifelong commitment, but he was also telling me, Cap, I'm not grading you off for your performance. Wow. And I, for so long, I had lived my life thinking that my approval, my identity was based off of my achievements, what I could, what, how I could perform. And he was telling me, Cap, you're mine. Let's just go on a walk together. Let's make today day one. And I will change you through this journey. And since then, it was this, that's, that's what I would say was the beginning of Jesus becoming the director of my craft, my career, my calling. Dude, it's so, it's such a powerful story. And we're going to get into more details from that point forward. But I look back on that moment as a 12 year old when, man, at that time, there was this curiosity and this hunger to know this God. And yet in a moment when you teed it up for the pastor, the reverend, he obviously says what he says and it sends you on this trajectory. But what's so interesting is I look at your story and how it unfolded from that moment. And mm -hmm. it, you can kind of probably even for yourself, look back on that moment and be like, man, why, why did it go that way? Or like, why did it happen that way? But it's so interesting because even in that, even in the years after that, where you didn't even believe in God or became agnostic or, you know, started chasing everything. It's like God was sovereign in all that hundred percent brings you to this moment. And I just, I just like look at your life and how God is ministering and directing through you now. Mm -hmm. And because of that story that you live, those yep. years of darkness, decay, destruction, turning your back on God, those years have become a foundation yes. for a lot of your bridge building with people that are lost. Yeah. So that's what's, it's, it's been so cool. So this moment happens, you come to Christ, you, you, you encounter him in a powerful way in your car. Now, maybe like fast forward, obviously, you know, there's, it's day by day. He's telling you day one, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you start, you start getting connected to a church yep. and then you end up in this like discipleship ministry called Patmos. Like tell yes. us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I was, after I got saved, I messaged my friend, Ricky Beans, Ricardo Boiso. He was the one who shared the gospel with me. I texted him. I was like, dude, I just gave my life to Jesus. And I'm sure he was kind of skeptical. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, but then he started to see this crazy fruit in me and this hunger. And I started to ask him like, what does this mean? And what about this? And so he was like, he was my discipler and every single day we'd hang out I'd ask him questions. We'd, sp we'd stay up until like 2 a.m. every night praying. I would like ask him everything. And I think for him, it was really healthy because he was trying to figure out how to walk the line of following Jesus in college. And, and now he's kind of got more purpose because he's got someone that he can mm. invest all of this, this wisdom and knowledge into. So he starts taking me to his church which was Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Crazy. So man. crazy. So I'm at the University of Miami. 
I'm driving like 45 minutes to an hour twice a week, Wednesday nights for Icon. That was the, the young adult ministry. And then Sundays for, uh, you know, big kid church, the, the regular church services. Yeah. And, um, and so through that, that's where I discovered this, this program called Patmos, which is a four month live in discipleship program. We joke around and say, it's like uh, Bible college meets survivor. <laughs> You have to like sign an NDA when you, when you go into it and, and, uh, people come out alive. So don't like, <laughs> don't think it's like that crazy. But part of it was you have to go into these four months with a sense of, I don't know what I'm getting myself into and learning how to literally walk by faith. And so every week was like crazy amounts of homework, crazy amounts of Bible study, reading books, and then practically living out very bizarre and oftentimes physically challenging challenges so that you would learn to rely on the Holy Spirit through these difficult things. It was like, it was kind of like a boot camp for me, honestly. And it was transformational because I went through that program and, and, uh, transparently for me, one of my biggest weaknesses where most of my regrets lie in life is I quit everything. Wow. I quit everything in high school. Every time the going got tough, I'd quit and I'd justify it. I quit wrestling. I quit football. I quit all of these sports that I really enjoyed doing. And I actually, I actually had a decent knack for, but I just didn't have, I didn't have the grit and mm -hmm. I didn't have the tenacity to follow through. Um, cause I just, I just wasn't something that was built in me. And I remember starting Patmos and I, they asked me at the beginning, they had to fill out this form or whatever, as you, as you start the, the four months. And one of the questions was, what's your greatest fear? Mm. And I wrote down on that paper, I said, my greatest fear is quitting Patmos. Because if I quit this and God has called me to do this, there's no way I can do anything else that he's called me to do in my life. Wow. There's no way I could be a great husband because I'll probably quit at that. There's no way I could be a great filmmaker for the kingdom because I'll probably quit at that. If I can't make it through this, I'll probably, I, I am a quitter. Wow. And so for me, wow. that was like, the Lord had to use this crazy season where I wanted to quit all the time. I lost a ton of weights because of the dietary discipline that we had. And I wasn't like a overweight person. And I had to, we memorized like hundreds of verses, ran like hundreds of miles while we were there, crazy amounts of work. And I finished. And I remember like one of, dude, this is what's so crazy. And this is coming to me right now. Um, so one of the, the most important things of my journey today that occurred while I was there, I, I had actually put down a camera for an entire year. So I got saved and then it was a year later I went to Patmos. Wow. I basically did not film anything for a year because I, I sensed the Lord say, I, want, I don't want this to get in the way between our relationship. Wow. And so are you willing to put down the camera and put it on the altar and really make pursuing me for pursuing me the goal rather than pursuing me to like get a career out of uh become you know me making you a filmmaker or whatever and i remember when i was in, in patmos towards the end of the term we're we're almost done we're we're finishing up at this mission trip in el salvador and one of the leaders hands me a camera wow and she says i want you to film basically a promo video of our trip here in el salvador this was the first time I was handed a camera ever since I put down the camera. And, and so I'm recording this video and, and now it's like, I'm, I have all the footage. We come back to America. It's only like two days before our graduation. The finish line is right there. There's no way I'm going to like not graduate if I don't finish this project. And so I had this conversation with myself. You don't need to finish the video. It's, it's like, you already got so much stuff you got to do. Da, da, da. And I was like, no, I have to finish. I got to finish well. I have to finish this project. So I, I would wake up at like four o'clock in the morning just to get this thing done. Finally got the thing done and finished Patmos. And then I was like, I could not get out of that environment fast enough. I was like, peace. I, we graduated. I deuced out. And, uh, and I was like, okay, now I got to figure out what I'm going to do with my life with this degree. I've just finished Patmos. My small group leader, in Patmos at the time, Dirk Reif, yep. you know him, oh, yeah. uh, awesome guy. He was a part of our ministry for a while here in Omaha. He told me that there was a pastor in Omaha who had actually come to teach during one of the weeks when we were in Patmos. His name was Pastor Todd Doxson, who is 
started a church in Omaha, Nebraska called Calvary Chapel, West Omaha. And he told me that Pastor Todd, PT, if you don't already know, he's the lead pastor of this church. He had been praying for a videographer for his church. And so I got connected with him. I sent him the one video I had, which was the video that I completed in Patmos. And he saw and he was like, dude, this is awesome. I want to send you to Guatemala with our mission team. I want you to film what's going on there. And so I say all of that because God broke this habit of quitting off of my life, really delivered me yeah, from this thing. Yep. And the one thing that I was like, almost didn't finish was my one ticket to actually be a part of what God was doing here in Omaha. I sent him this video. PT's Dude. like, you want to go to Guatemala with our mission team? We'll even pay you to do it. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm getting paid to go to Guatemala to, fin to film a, a, a trip, a mission trip? Sign me up. You're like, let's go. Let's man. go. So this is my first paid gig outside of Patmos. And, uh, and then that's where I met you yeah, in Guatemala. We, we, we did meet there. And it's so crazy, man. Like, because you're one of your key messages that you share is like, you were the director and then God became the director. Yes. Right. Like that's one of your key messages. And it's so interesting when you're telling the story, it's like, I can see the director orchestrating these moments. Like yes. what are the odds that, that, that here you are at Miami, you're going to church at Calvary, Fort Lauderdale, where Pastor you. Todd and Denise they, were, were the on bro. staff. Yes. And then they get planted out of Calvary, Fort Lauderdale, come to Omaha. Then he's back <laughs> oh because God. of a relationship with Pastor oh, Chet. Jesus. Happens to teach at Patmos, yes. which, by the way, Dirk is there working. Yes. And Dirk was previously a part of this ministry. Yes. And we need a videographer. And there's just like all these components. So yes. here we are. It's, yes. It's Guatemala. 2014 and you and I meet, bro. Yes. It was such a fun season and I'll never forget it because like right away there was just such amazing synergy mm -hmm. and I, like that mission trip was so fun partially because literally Jay and I, Jerica, my wife, we were going to get married like one month later. Yeah. What was so interesting is we meet on this trip and we have such a good vibe that do you remember we're like, hey, why don't you fly to Omaha yes, yes. and film our wedding, yep, bro? Yep. And like we set that whole thing up. And so then you fast forward and next thing you know, you find yourself in Omaha, not just to do our wedding, but I think you were coming out to do some stuff for the church as well. Yeah, that's right. Can so, you tell us like a little bit about that? Yeah. So when we finished our trip in Guatemala, the, one of the things that really just resonated with me was like, I had never felt at home in a community like that. Mm. Like I just... My heart got so connected to the entire team so quickly. And I was just like, I was just like, man, these people, these people feel like my people. Yeah. And then, so I go to Omaha, we do the work for your wedding, which is super fun. And then we did some work for, uh, we did some testimony videos for Calvary Chapel, West Omaha. And now it's like, this is September. And now I'm starting to really sense. It was a setup, bro. Oh, it was a totally a setup. Set up. hundred percent a setup. And so I was like, man, I really feel like God is drawing me to Omaha, Nebraska, which is so ironic because I'm thinking I finished film school. I'm like, all right, God, where do you want me to start my film career? New York, L.A., you want me to stay <laughs> in Miami? And then he's like, no, actually, I want you to go to Omaha, Nebraska. Like, and I was like, where's Omaha, Nebraska? Pull it up, pull it up on the map. I'm like, it's literally smack dab in the middle of the country. And so it, it was like not on my radar at all to just be completely honest. But I'm, I'm in this moment. I come home from that trip when I, I met up with you guys in Omaha, came back to Hollywood, Florida. I'm living in Hollywood, Florida at the time. Not Hollywood, California. Yeah. <laughs> the other Hollywood, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And so I'm living in Hollywood, uh, Florida. And I'm praying and I'm like, God, like, I'll know that I'm called to go there if there's a job. Because I needed a job. I was like, I need to like start making some money to pay bills and all that sort of stuff. So I reached out to Pastor Todd and I said, hey, PT, I'm really interested in coming out and being a part of what God's doing there. Is there a job opportunity available? And this is like, the church was just so like, so green. It was so new. And so there wasn't like, there wasn't a job opportunity available for a videographer, which I totally understand now. Yep. And uh, he was like, hey, we don't have a job opportunity available, but if you want to come serve, you can come serve, which if you're in the ministry world, you know, is code for, if you want to come work for free. <laughs> Come work for, work for free, free <laughs> my guy. And serve God. Obviously, it's yeah. about serving the Lord. Totally. But it's totally. like, uh, hey, if God's calling you to come, like, we're not going to say no if you want to come and be a part of it. 
And so, but that was a big test for me. Wow. Because I was in bed or I was like in my room about to go to bed and, um, mm. and I have to give this detail because yeah, it will make sense. To. Yeah. Um, my dad had actually just got off the phone with me. This is October. This is September. We were planning my flights to go see my family in Louisiana for Thanksgiving. We were going to fly me out of Miami airport to take me to New Orleans. Important detail. You'll see why shortly. And then after that call with my dad, still wrestling through why, why, if God's really calling me there, why isn't there the provision uh -huh. for a job? Yep. I open up to the book of Haggai, which is really wild that we're doing this recording right now in the month of October while I'm, you know, it just, it's just really wild. We can talk offline, yeah. but it's like, it's the, what happened in that moment when I opened up Haggai, it's still like being manifested to this day, yep. honestly. Yep. And I open up this, this book. I've never read the book of Haggai before. And basically the summary of it is God's people who were taken exile into Babylon are finally released to come back home. And as they come back home, they get distracted. And their focus becomes once they get back home, they finally get freedom after 70 years in exile. They build up their own paneled houses. Mm -hmm. They're chasing after their own comfort, their own lifestyles. And God says to them through the prophet Haggai, Guys, you wonder why you fill up your pockets with money and it's like you got holes in them. You wonder why you eat to no end, but you, your bellies are never full. You wonder why you put on clothes, but you can't stay warm. I'm the one who blew your crops away in the harvest mm -hmm. because you saw that my temple was in ruins, but you went and went and built your own paneled houses instead. Wow. And the, the, the phrase that God gave me was build the temple. And the people then go, they repent, they build the temple, and then there's this massive blessing, and God says, watch the glory that I'll pour out on this work, and also watch how I bring in riches from the other nations to, to fulfill the work that I'm doing in this temple. And so, wow, basically, I'm reading this, and it's one of those moments where I'm reading it, and I'm like, is God trying to speak to me? Because I'm reading this like, am I building my own paneled house? Am I chasing after my own career? Am I more concerned about my comfort than doing the work that God's called me to do? And it was one of those moments where I was like, nah, that, nah, that wasn't that ain't for me. That, that wasn't it, God. Yeah. No, just like that was coincidental. <laughs> and then I go to bed and then I have this crazy dream. Wow. And then in this dream, uh, basically I'll summarize the dream right now. God, God confirms everything that I that I read in that book speaks to me through a killer whale in the dream. We'll save that for another, another video, but basically he has this, it's this extremely prophetic dream where God challenges me and says, get out of the boat, get out of your comfort zone. Do you want a career or do you want to receive your calling that I prepared for you before the foundations of the Jeez. earth, your choice. And I wake up from this dream and I knew what God was telling me to do. And I knew that he was making this invitation of like, Cap, there's a work out there. I'm inviting you to do it. And as soon as I woke up, two minutes later, my phone vibrates on the nightstand. It's my dad. My dad, who had just bought my plane ticket from Florida to Louisiana for Thanksgiving. He says, Cap, we got something wrong with your flight and we need to get you a completely new plane ticket. Can you help me figure out what's the best time and day for you to fly again? And I'm confused. I'm like, how did you mess that up? Or it just didn't make sense to me how it all messed up. But looking back, I know exactly why it all got messed up. Because in that moment, God said, here's your chance. Where are you going to be flying from, Cap? Are you going to be flying from Miami, Florida? Or are you going to be flying from Omaha, Nebraska? Woo! Wow. And I texted my dad and I said, Dad, if you got to get a new plane ticket, please get my plane ticket from Omaha, Nebraska, because God just told me to move there. <laughs> all of a sudden... Bring me, bring me. My dad's like, what? And I'm like, I'll tell you later. God spoke <laughs> to me in a dream through a killer whale. I got him to go on Nebraska. And he was oh. like, gosh, my son's life has just gotten really strange. <laughs> and so, but he was super supportive. My parents were super supportive. Packed my bags a month later, drove halfway across the country and started my new life here in Omaha. Started working for the church as a volunteer. Shortly after, a job opened up. I got, I got invited to be the creative director at Love Church, February 1st, 2015. Met my wife here as well. We, we got married. Now we have uh, three kids, one on the way, about to have a family of six. And uh, it's just amazing how everything, it's not just that everything fell into place, but 
I I walked walked into my inheritance by coming to Omaha. Nebraska. That's what you did, man. It yeah. may, it reminds me of the verse of scripture that says obedience is greater than sacrifice yeah. and Amen, it's better dude. than sacrifice. Amen. I mean, I, I just, you're, you're, I think one of the things that I just love about who you are in Christ is you are a man that just, that wants to walk with radical obedience. Yeah. And I've watched, Praise God. I've watched you, you do that time and time and time again, and not to receive the blessing, but on the backside, you've been blessed. Like, it's yeah. like God has breathed on your life. From the moment you showed up to where you sit today. And um, I would be remiss to at least, I know you mentioned like, man, you get married to joy and you have this family. Like, what does your family mean to you? Dude, my family, my family is like everything to me right now. I mean, as they should be. But I think what's, you know, and, and I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it today. Maybe we will. But um, the Lord has just done such a work through me especially this year with my my influence for the kingdom online mm-hmm. and it's been really an interesting journey because it's been an explosion where like literally millions of people across the world they at least have seen my face and know my name uh, some of them are really invested into the content i'm putting out on behalf of jesus but it's like it's really wild because as much as that that audience and that influence expands, it's like the thing that I really care about actually gets smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. For me, I'm like, man, like I love it. I love getting to serve people. I love getting to point people to Jesus across the world over the internet. But for me, it's like I live for days like today. It's a it's a forecast, uh, uh, or what's it called? It's an overcast overcast today, day yeah. today. Yeah. It's cloudy outside. Brave is like. I just left and Brave was playing his new Mario game with joy on the Switch. And I was like, man, I want to play. I like, give me the sticks later. I'm going to smoke you guys. Like, I just love hanging out with my family. Uh, my home is a sanctuary. My wife is my biggest cheerleader. I couldn't do anything yeah. that I do right now without her. And uh, my kids are just a joy, man. And so it's just fun, bro. I feel like I've really hacked the system. I'm just like, I see the grace on me. your life and it, you know, um, when I was sitting down with PT, I shared a quote by Mark Batterson. I, I think you'll, you'll really resonate with this. He says, I want to be respected the most by those who know me the best. hundred percent. And I yeah. just, I see That's you, it. I see you, I see you running out after that value. So just be encouraged, man. Maybe like Praise God. help our listeners. Cause you, you did allude to it. And this is kind of where we'll, where we'll sort of li- uh, end this episode, but you know, you just talked about, man, all that God's done to expand your influence in this last year, but that, that wasn't without some, re- some really difficult times, Yeah, you know, before you walk through that. So maybe just walk us through the last three years of your life and just what has transpired, because I think that will really resonate for some of our listeners. For sure. Uh, well, a handful of years ago, God called me actually to start a business. He called me to start a digital media agency. You were a part of actually the, the real uh, inception or conception, <laughs> inception is a movie, conception of that whole venture. And the, the idea was um, to create a, an agency for, for digital media where we would tell God's stories at scale. And then God kind of reorganized how that whole thing would plan, pan out. Um, and I started to try to build this company while also serving as a minister at the church. 2020 hits, 2020 was, uh, anyone remember 2020? is a pretty bizarre year. But I remember 2020 was really interesting for me because while everyone was really confused, most people were really confused. Where do we go from here? Especially in the ministry world where it's like, we gather in person, we minister in person. For me as a digital media guy, I was running downhill. I was like, let's go. We started the Love Church, like Love Church TV. We created the Love Kids show. And so for me, it was like, I started to see the opportunity of how we could reach people at scale online with the gospel. Yep. And that was just really fun for me. But then if, I com- if I'm completely honest, I started to get so focused on keeping my business growing so that I could do ministry. Like the business became a means to do ministry and that became my focus. Let's get more sales. Let's get more revenue. Let's get more clients. And um, it was like, we'll get to the kingdom work once we get this stuff established wow and and last year was like what i say it was probably the worst year of my life yep my business got flipped upside down profitably we were hemorrhaging cash 
I was taking on debt to keep employees uh, aboard and to take care of their families. And then uh, simultaneously, my wife had a health crisis. We finished a workout one day. She wasn't feeling great. She took her blood sugar test and her blood sugar was north of 400. And if anybody's watching who has, you know, have, you either have diabetes or you have family members that have diabetes, you're probably familiar that you need to have anywhere between 75 and 125 is normal. She was, she was at the level of organ failure. So we rushed her to the ER. We didn't know she was a diabetic. They told her, uh, congratulations, you're a type one diabetic. Oh, and you also have about three or four other autoimmune disorders on top of that. Wow. And our health insurance wouldn't cover pretty much any of it. So I'm paying for all of these medical bills out of my personal savings. And I'm trying to keep this business afloat. And then meanwhile, there's some stuff happening even with my kids and their development. And I'm just getting squeezed, squeezed from every side. And I just, I was on my face in my office and I said, God, what gives? And I'm not, it's not like a proud thing to say, but that's, that's, that was my honest cry to him. Yeah. I was like, what gives? Like, I'm trying to do my best to serve you and to lead this company well and to pray before our meetings and to tithe and all that sort of stuff. And he said, Cap, mm. you got Matthew 6, 33 backwards. You've been seeking after all of these things, your business, the revenue, your clients, all of that hoping that the kingdom of God, the work that I actually called you to do would be added unto you when the, that's not what the verse says. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. And I just recognized like I was doing, I wasn't doing bad things. I was doing decent things and slapping his name on it, but I wasn't doing the thing he actually told me to do. And there's a big difference yep. between obedience and well-intentioned disobedience wow 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 Seriously. and he cares about order he cares about order and so i said god i reestablished a covenant with god and i said god i'm all in i'm gonna do this right your way and starting this year i've i had a plan i've had four months of savings left i told joy i said i i really think god's telling me to go all in and create content for the kingdom I have no idea how this will monetize at all. I'm just being fully faithful to God and I'm sure that he'll come, he'll figure out a way to, to, to monetize this, whether it's through the ad revenue or whatever. And my wife gave me the blessing and she said, I trust you. I trust Christ in you. So cool. Dude, it was such, it was such a blessing, man. Unbelievable. And so for four months, every single day, three times a day, some days it was two, some days I missed a day. It was, but mostly it was three to four videos every single day for four months and i saw i saw my instagram account blow up i saw my facebook account blow up hundreds of thousands of followers TikTok blow up finally youtube was the slow burner on the fourth month it took me four months to get from a thousand around a thousand subscribers to ten thousand subscribers and then on that fourth month it just hockey sticked and i went from ten thousand to 100,000 in 28 days. And then I went from 100,000 to 200,000 in 10 days. Oof. It was just this crazy growth. The monetization started to come through. Seven months later, after this whole thing, God grew this modest following of about 5,500 followers on all my platforms to over 2 million. And since then, it's been like, it's been explosive. It's been explosive for my family. Uh, it's been explosive for the work, but it's been explosive for the kingdom. For dude. the gospel, bro. Dude, it's been amazing to see. We'll have these like these triggered automations in our Slack channel every time someone gives their life to Jesus online. And so we'll see like, you'll get like random notifications yeah. on a Thursday. Oh, yeah. After I do this, I'll do another live stream, do an altar call. And you'll have like Gustavo from, you know, Portugal just gave his life to Jesus. You're like, like, yeah. Elizabeth from the Netherlands just gave her life to Jesus. And you're like, dude, what on earth? And so what's amazing, man, is here I am, 2023. God gave me a second chance. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a redemption story with something that was like, hey, I already have this in store for you. You royally fumbled the rock before but I'm going to restore it. Somebody needs to hear that. I'm going to give you, I'm telling you, man, God gave me a second chance with this calling. And I really believe that he also accelerated it so that it would pick up 
what was uh what was missing what i missed out on in the years before i think there's a key man that somebody needs to catch because somebody's getting a second chance but the thing about your story with your second chance and this this inspired me and continues to inspire me because i got to watch you really closely i mean you were my neighbor when you went all in and dude you went all in and so like (laughs) all, all in, in. Bro. so for somebody oh, that's dude, like getting rough. so for somebody that's getting the second chance though they need to Jeez. hear that because sometimes Jeez. i think when we get the second chance we want to like kind of dip our toe Damn, dude but you went all in and i've watched the hand of god jesus do exceedingly abundantly above all we could think ask or imagine and it's absolutely Jeez. incredible what we get to celebrate god doing in the kingdom and it's just so cool man like it's it's such an honor to watch god just build your personal influence and and push the gospel through your personal influence. But you've also stepped in as our online pastor at Love Church, and you've really connected this personal work to what God's doing here at Love yeah, Church as we expand amazing. online. And we just got to celebrate with our team this last week that in in season two, in a four month span, uh, six hundred and seventy one yeah. salvations, bro. Let's go! Like, are you kidding me? So Eternal hard. addresses change forever, and a large Jeez. part of that is due to like your faithfulness, your leadership, and I mean, just as your friend, I want to say, keep going, keep the main thing, the main thing, keep walking out Matthew six thirty three. Amen. Keep loving your family well, and I promise you, as much as this year has blown your mind. The best, the best is yet to come. I believe that. And I want to finish just kind of with one, one question for you. Yeah. We've talked about all that God has done in this short amount of time, but if the Lord tarries and you know, you like, we look 40 years out from now. Yeah. Like what is, just tell me like, what do you, what, like, what do you, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your legacy to be? Or as you look 40, 40 years out, what are some things that, that you see for your life? Well, first and foremost, I want to make sure that, like that quote from Mark Batterson's huge, man. I I want to make sure that I I want my children, when they're adults, I want us to be best friends. So good. I I love that. I want Brave and Quinn to be my best buds, my bros. And I want Raven to be, I want her to be, you know, obviously connected to her husband more than anything. But um, I want, I just want a relationship with my kids where it's like, we're continuing to do life together. We're continuing to build for the kingdom together. Um, it's not like they turn 18 and then that chapter closes, but it's like, no, we're, all right, now we're in the major leagues together. Let's go. So I believe that that's going to happen, man. And then um, whatever God's, however God's wired them and gifted them to do what, what he wants for them to do. Mm-hmm. But for me, man, I have such a clear vision. I have a 20 year vision. I believe it's going to happen in sooner than 40 years. But my vision is for the glory of God to be revealed on every glowing screen. It's a measurable goal. Every IP address, every desktop computer, every phone, iPhone or Android across the globe will have the gospel going forth contextualized in their language for their community in a way that's relevant and exciting and and easy to, to digest. I see that happening in such a way where it can't be escaped. I, I see it happening in the next 20 years, man. So I, my desire is to just play a part in that, not just my content, but seeing other kingdom content creators raised up. I see uh, churches like ours becoming studios, putting out original stories, really saying, you know what? Because you know we have a whole generation that's just captivated by this device yeah. and this thing isn't going away. And I said this in my last message, honestly, like this thing isn't the problem. This thing is a gateway to the problem. Yes. This thing is a portal to what's really in your heart or what your heart's chasing after. And we have an opportunity to put, put the King in front of as many people as possible. And so I see, I see a crazy movement happening in media. I love your dream, man. And I believe it's going to happen. And you're, you're just, you're, you're a remarkable man of God. So gifted and talented. Thank you. And, uh, just man, continue to communicate the gospel faithfully love your wife faithfully, squeeze those kids, man. And um, it's just fun to be able to do this life with you, man. Yeah, same for me, man. This has been fun. Yeah. Lord, I pray that you would just, uh, man, you would use this story to speak to hearts. Just your grace has just been all over Cap's life. And we're just so thankful to be able to celebrate just how 
good of a director you are. You tell the best stories. Yes, Lord. And if you did it for him, you can do it for us. And so, God, I pray that that hope would be lifted as listeners tune into this, uh, that dreams would be planted, mm -hmm. that even just through the storytelling and the, the imagery and the pictures and the stories, God, that you would be planting dreams and yeah. hearts prophetically. We're just believing, God, that um, this is the hour. And uh, we're so grateful and thankful for what for the story that you're writing uh, through his life, through his family's life. God, we just pray no weapon formed against him would prosper. Would you amen. bless him and keep him? And would you receive the glory? Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's been fun, man. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Yeah.